America. Welcome to your Wednesday edition of Just the News, No Noise. I'm your host, Amanda Head, reporting to you from Los Angeles, California. And, you know, as I was reading the news headlines today, I realized how many statewide stories have kind of slid under the radar. So I want to bring you a few of those headlines in greater detail before we segue into federal politics and national news. So to start, in Illinois, their state Senate could consider a bill to address squatters. Republican State Senator Dave Syverson told their Judiciary Committee stories about innocent people experiencing and being forced to fight with squatters. And in his new bill, it would untie first responders' hands and give the police force more authority to remove these squatters from homes. And in some West Coast news, a California bill that would have banned homeless encampments near sensitive sites like schools and transit stops It failed in the Senate committee despite early bipartisan efforts. Now, the legislation was modeled after a plan that the city of San Diego already has in place, which has been considered extremely successful. Meanwhile, a group of six governors are warning auto workers in their states that voting to unionize would put their jobs in jeopardy. The vote is tomorrow, and thousands of auto workers in Tennessee are expected to vote on whether they want to be represented by the UAW which led major strikes against automakers in Detroit and whose president is backing Joe Biden. Non-unionized workers at an auto plant in Alabama uh, Alabama also filed paperwork to hold a similar vote, but no date for that election has been set. And later this hour, we're going to be joined by a union watchdog executive director who dishes the details on the UAW and help us understand the pivotal importance of this vote coming today. Furthermore, along the campaign trail, Joe Biden is vying for a second term despite his old age and how embarrassing his event turnout is for supposedly getting 81 million votes. But he continued on through his second day in the battleground state of Pennsylvania. Yesterday, he was in Scranton pitching Americans a new tax plan. Today, he was in Pittsburgh greeting the United Steelworkers Union and delivering remarks which called on his U.S. trade representative to triple the tariff rate on China steel and aluminum imports. Now, this sounds like a great call to action, but the setting and the people in the industry that he said this in front of has me thinking that he just might be virtue signaling as hard as he can with the union workforce before the 2024 election. But we're going to be monitoring what comes from this late command. And on another note, we kick tonight off with a very special guest. He's not just the senator that represents the great people of my home state of Alabama, but he's been standing on principle and holding the Biden administration accountable from day one. Just yesterday, Senator Tuberville introduced the VA Abortion Transparency Act to impose new abortion reporting requirements on the Department of Veterans Affairs to create more transparency for taxpayers. Now, you might remember it was just two years ago when the Biden administration's VA announced that they would facilitate abortions for veterans and their dependents, and despite congressional inquiry on policy and legality, They've changed the regulation anyway, kind of on brand for them. But just last October, the VA reported that the agency facilitated 88 abortions. And in doing so, the VA has since refused to release updated data regarding additional abortions since its last report. So joining me now to discuss this, as well as the the pending impeachment trial of Homeland Security Department Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas is Senator Tuberville. Coach, it's an honor to have you here. Welcome back. Thank you. Great to be here. Sir, I want to ask you about what you introduced yesterday because, you know, progressives, Democrats, the Biden administration, they seem so vocal and committed to support for and access to abortion. So I don't really understand the obfuscation. Well, you have to give it to the Democrats, progressive uh, left. They're they're all in for abortion at any time, any place, anywhere on the taxpayer dime. You know, in 1992, the Veterans Health Care Act was passed here in Uh, um the senate and the house uh, by the democrats voted on by joe biden and uh, it became law that uh, says that the va can never provide abortions and so they've just done an about face uh biden administration is breaking the law so after they started breaking the law i started asking questions about hey can we get a little transparency here we need to get some facts and figures about what you're doing and why you're doing it and how much it's costing the taxpayers well we can't get anything so I'm putting out the Transparency Abortion VA Act to try to get a little bit of of cooperation from this administration, but they can care less. Uh, They they hate this country the way it is. They want to transition it to something else, and they're doing a pretty good job of it. Yeah, unfortunately, they have made a lot of progress since Joe Biden was inaugurated. 
And you have been such a thorn in their side. It's been really wonderful to see your Republican colleagues in the Senate. Are you are you feeling a lot of support from them already? Yeah, most. Of course, we got seven or eight that went after me on the on the abortion issue in the military when I was holding up the mm -hmm. the promotions for all the flag flag officers. But uh, that's fine. Everybody kind of got exposed. Uh, I'm pro-life. Uh, and and a lot of these people, not not Republicans, but uh, most of the Democrats, they're for abortion all the way, sometimes even past the birth of the baby. So it just it's a it's another uh, day in the life of the Barnum and Bailey Circus up here, Amanda. I mean, it just it just goes to show you up here. Anything goes. The law doesn't matter here. Our Department of Justice is out of control. And uh, it's hey. They do anything they want, and they've got the ball in their court right now. We just got to take the ball away from them in November at the next election, or we're going to be in tough times. I think that's exactly right, sir. Um, I have a tough time, though, understanding, because I don't know if, if Democrats on Capitol Hill, whether it's the House or the Senate, are reflective of the population body, because you've got 5% of Americans who are pro-life all the way, absolutely, and 5% of Americans on the other end of the spectrum who are pro-choice all the way, anytime up until the moment of birth. But it seems to me that more Democrats are within that 5% of extremism on the left rather than being in the 90% in the middle. Yeah, uh, they're starting to show their colors a little bit more and more in terms of how that goes and uh, what they really support. A lot of them don't want to, especially up here in the Senate and the House, it's all about getting reelected, Amanda. Uh, and that uh, a lot of people, even Republicans, stand on the fence. They don't get on either side to see which way the wind blows. And uh, instead of having any kind of values that they stand behind, you know, I'm here to represent the people of Alabama, not just me. And so I go by how the people want me to vote uh, up here from the state of Alabama. And uh, but that that goes few and far between up here. You have a lot that uh, basically vote their conviction convictions for themselves to get reelected. And uh, if we don't get away from that, we're going to lose this country as we know it. Absolutely. Um, sir, I, I think that you you do. You're one of those senators who you actually listen to your constituents and you keep your thumb on the pulse of what Alabamians are thinking and feeling. And there was an Alabamian who was lost in an army helicopter crash, Stephen Dwyer from Enterprise, Alabama, which for our audience is South Alabama. I know that you haven't gleaned any information yet from the Department of Defense, but it seems to me that this is a little endemic of of the culture of the Biden administration, which is not really telling the American people or senators much of anything. Well, I think the family, just not just a, a young man from uh, Enterprise, Alabama, should have some closure here on what actually happened in this helicopter mm -hmm. crash. It was a night training mission, supposedly. Now they were in the Mediterranean and, uh, have, you know, they tell me that it's very, very dangerous to be refueling helicopters at night, especially with wind blowing and all those kind of things and something happened, but we will get the true, uh, uh, data on the report. As soon as it's done, I asked the uh, special ops commander last week uh, about this very thing and they're still looking into it. Obviously they got their hands full right now with what's going on in the Middle East and Ukraine and all these areas, but People uh, that lose a loved one need to need to have some closure on this. I think that's right. And I know that they are appreciative of you for for seeking that out. I want to shift gears to impeachment of Alejandro Mayorkas. Obviously, those articles marched over to the upper chamber. Um, you know, I feel like Alejandro Mayorkas was the low hanging fruit as far as impeachment. What do you see as his fate? Well, they all should be impeached. Uh, every Democrat, uh, the entire administration, uh, what they've done to the American people and to our country this been 248 years of opening that border and just continually saying, hey, it's closed. Uh, you know, we, there's nothing else we can do when they just all they had to do is go by the same laws and rules that President Trump had had uh, implemented when he was in office. We wouldn't be in this situation, but the American taxpayers are going to pay a huge financial price and probably going we're going to lose some people in this country to some kind of uh uh unfortunate act by one of these people that's come across you know we've had 25 20 to twenty five thousand chinese immigrants come across the border in just the last five or six months that's devastating and of course you've got terrorists coming in you've got fentanyl you know there's hundreds of thousands of people losing their lives because of this decision by the biden administration it's probably the, the 
most uh, detrimental thing to our country that's happened in my lifetime is being a United States citizen. And it's happened because we have some people that just could absolutely care less about the people here. They want votes and they want power. Yes, sir. Um, you know, I know a lot of people don't necessarily consider Alabama a border state, but it's obviously on the Gulf of Mexico, just like Florida is. So I think that that puts it right up there uh, as a border state. And when I'm home in the suburb that I'm from outside of Birmingham, I have definitely noticed an explosion of illegal immigrants in that area. When you're in Alabama and you're out there speaking to your constituents, is that top of mind for them? Oh, yeah. Uh, you, we're, we're starting to see more and more. We've had one high school in the northern part of the state that uh, a year and a half ago, I think, two years ago, they were probably 25 percent uh, Hispanic. Uh, now they're close to 90 percent. Uh, it's not just hurting the, the cities. It's hurting the rural areas and the hospitals and the doctor's offices and the education opportunities that our kids are supposed to have. And it's costing a fortune. And uh, we're having uh, young people go way behind in the things that we desperately need. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, last year, the ACT and SAT scores were the lowest of all time uh, from high school graduating seniors all over the country. This is not Alabama. So uh, we got a huge problem. We don't know how to answer this problem. Money's not going to fix it. It's going to have to be a lot of people are going to have to do a lot of hard work. We're going to have to make some tough decisions. And I think President Trump's going to do that. He said he's going to send them home. And I truly believe that. I think that uh, it's going to really save us some money. Uh, but just unfortunately, right now, for the next six, seven, eight months, we're going to have to put up with these people up here that could care less about the taxpayers. They care about their power here in uh, Washington, D.C. Yeah, I think we're going to have to be in minimized damage mode for the next seven months until there can be some reprieve. Um, sir, I wanted to ask you about the so-called debt forgiveness, which, let's face it, is debt transfer. And I love a tweet that you put out because I love seeing things in practical numbers. And you tweeted out that 87% of Americans are ultimately going to be paying for 13% of those folks who took out those loans. Joe Biden is uh, leading Donald Trump with 65 and over, which is strange to me, but he's leading them by five points, but he's underwater by 12 points with Gen Z. Do you think that's why? Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's, he's out there buying votes right and left. And he's doing it for a purpose, you know, that I don't think that he thinks he can win by just going out and going by the issues because every issue that they've touched has gone south. But, you know, these, these people that have uh, that are getting their their loans forgiven, uh, as you said, 87 percent of us that either pay for our loans or didn't have a loan uh, or didn't go to college uh, or having are going to have to pay for that, and make that up. That's not something that's just going to go away. But, you know, Amanda, in this country, we're we're morally we're mentally and we're physically bankrupt. Uh, and this mm -hmm. just puts us on a line of just more bankruptcy, uh, puts us in a tough situation. You know, we actually, everybody, we want to help everybody. Everybody needs to help each other, but they've made it so volatile in this country by this DEI, all the things that they push in American people, they've divided us and they've dumbed us down. And uh, that's, uh, it's going to pay huge. It's going to be a huge cost to the Americans uh, in the years and years to come. Yeah. Bankrupt, frustrated, exhausted. <laughs> the list goes on and on. Sir, we've just got less than a minute left. I want to end on a lighter note. You are a U.S. Senator, but you are to a lot of people in the state of Alabama. Coach Auburn had, I believe, a top eight recruiting class for 2024. Are you excited about this fall? Yeah, I'm excited. I'm, I'm always excited about sports because it's one of the few things that you can get away from all this madness, especially when you work up here in Washington, D.C., uh, I'm worried about our, our our sports in our country because of this NIL. Uh, I think it's yeah. putting us on a, a crash course of doing something detrimental to our young people, uh, as social media has done. Uh, yes. I, I want all these players to have the most money they can possibly get. They need to be able to be taken care of. But my goodness, you know, the money that some of these people are making, some of these kids I know. is going to be detrimental to not just them, but everybody around them. Yes. Yes, Senator, I agree. NIL, the transfer portal, it is a new day in NCAA sports, and it's very strange. Senator War Eagle to you. Thank you so much for being here. We'll have you back on again very soon. We're going to take a break. Welcome back, America. As I said at the top of the hour, President Biden's lackluster hometown trip back to Scranton, Pennsylvania, where he had a very hard time 
getting off the plane, filling the room, and then, of course, reading a teleprompter. Well, take a quick look at these few senior moments that really lit up social media the past 24 hours. Check it out. My grandfather would tell me when I walked out the door in North, Scr North, 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 Scr in North Washington Avenue in Scranton, you know, uh, thanks to the mayor, Paige, can, can, excuse me, I'm gonna, I was going to talk about the old mayor. I think I should go home now. <laughs> Except I'm already home. Have another cocktail, Joe. All right, now the only question that remains is whether or not this campaign performance it's going to have him defeated long before November, because we certainly know VP Harris isn't any better. Matt Schlapp is the chairman of the American Conservative Union and is here to dive into campaigns, elections, the latest polling news. Matt, great to have you back there. Great to be with you, Amanda. He is Scranton Joe, Matt. Um, I'm trying to understand why. I mean, we, we saw the pictures of this room. There was an entire section, which, let's face it, it's not a big section. It could only hold 20 or so people that was completely empty. Um, 81 million votes. Anybody still buy that? <laughs> it, it's always been kind of a, you know, I, I would say it this way. That was the strangest election uh, we've ever had uh, in our lifetime. <laughs> and the idea that Joe Biden uh, is uh, someone that more people than any other point in history decided to get so excited about him to vote for him. Now, the Trump haters will say that that was all based on the fact that they hated Trump so much. And that's why he got so many votes. But uh you know, it's hard for them to put together a plausible argument that there's any enthusiasm for him. And I think you can see this with the events he goes to. I mean, the Trump phenomenon of filling up stadiums is a unique thing in American politics. He engenders a lot of passion, a lot of positive passion, um, more positive than negative. And, uh, and so, yeah, I think it's, you know, and the Democrats, they might do anything. Amanda, I wouldn't put anything by them. So your questions are valid. Boy, oh boy, I, I agree with you. I don't put anything past them. And looking at November, you know, I when I look at the polling and I look at the sentiment and I look at the crowds that gather for Donald Trump and I look at the direction of this country and in every avenue that's failing under Joe Biden, and it seems to me that there is no way that Donald Trump loses this contest. But again, there is the election integrity factor. When you look at the new leadership at the RNC and the efforts that they are making to actually clean up and fortify elections, do you think that things are improving? Yeah, I have to give Michael Watley and Laura Trump a lot of credit at the RNC. They've got a tough job to do. They've got to make up for some lost time. Uh, I know that Chairman Watley uh, understands election law well, and he uh, understands how the RNC works, and he was a very able chairman in North Carolina where we didn't read about a lot of uh, voting irregularities in that state. And he's going to bring that knowledge uh, to the RNC. I'm, I'm very glad that uh, he's there, and I think the money situation is getting better. Uh, and I think Laura's really taken a lead on that. And I think Americans are waking up to the fact that we might not be able to survive four more years of Joe Biden. And, uh, and I think Donald Trump's going to be our next president. I certainly hope so. And I want to ask you about this X factor that we saw play out again yesterday. President Trump, after uh, that day of court proceedings was adjourned, he went up to West Harlem. This is, this is Washington Heights. This is a Biden plus 90 part of town. And from our camera's purview, you literally could not see the end of the crowd. Do you think that Donald Trump should make a strategic and historical decision as a Republican to throw some rallies in some of these deep blue areas? Yeah, I do. I think uh, for a couple of reasons. I think the wide open border, Biden's open border has created a huge crime wave around the country. Sadly, I don't like saying it. Um, and I think we're seeing huge changes in the voting uh, preferences for people in minority communities who are being affected by that crime, also being affected by the Biden economy generally. Things are just too expensive, especially the things that people who make less money worry the most about, uh, you know, food, gasoline, the staples, paying your utilities, energy prices, um, you know, the, all those basic commodities uh, that you have to to live, they have to pay for to live, um, are, uh, are unreachable to a lot of people. And they're having to make those kinds of decisions. And for all that, Donald Trump is um, being reconsidered by a lot of voters who normally wouldn't vote for a Republican for president. So um, I think he should go to those areas. I think he should compete for it. I think what he did on the first step act in criminal justice reform makes him uh, a sentimental choice for a lot of black families who have faced the fact that the justice system sometimes uh, treats people unfairly. And Donald Trump is the poster child for a justice system that treats people unfairly. And it that in and of itself 
creates sympathy in the minds of a lot of voters and gives him a chance to make his case why his policies will work. And by the way, when he talks about his policies, he's pushing on an open door because almost everybody knows the policies were fantastic. Then you have this question about personalities. And uh, I tell you what, uh, I think the policy is a lot more important than someone's you know, concern over a tweet here or there. Absolutely. Uh, the old adage goes that if you are young and conservative, you don't have a heart. If you're old and liberal, you don't have a brain. But we are seeing something <laughs> interesting with the polling because Donald Trump is ahead with the youngest demographic, with Gen Z, and he's actually fallen five points behind in the 65 plus demographic. Now, I understand why that's happening with young Americans, because they're starting to pay taxes. They're trying to get a leg up and it's not working. But for 65 and over, why are those people going for Biden? It's interesting, could be generational. You know, you have these themes that are, uh, you know, uh, that uh, dominate in certain generations. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that hippie generation is getting kind of old, Amanda. I know it's hard for us to think about it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But uh, in many ways, that's the, the, the part of the electorate that Joe Biden really um, uh, courted and appealed to. But I think what will get those older voters to vote for Trump in the end is, number one, economic insecurity, and number two, all these wars. Um, Joe Biden's weakness is going to make their grandkids go to war. And uh, they got to really think about that. And I think, uh, you know, usually war is a rallying cry to get behind the American president. But I think Joe Biden is much more like Lyndon Johnson, where war fatigue and bad leadership resulted in Lyndon Johnson not even be able to run again. Um, and Joe Biden clearly is running again. But I think it's going to be one of the main barriers why he loses when we read what's going on in the Middle East. And you try to figure out what the Biden policies on Israel. And you know what? Anytime someone speaks, it's different from what someone said the time before. And it's impossible to see a clear direction coming out of the White House. Ukraine, I feel like, is the same. If They've never once made the case to you or me, Amanda, that they have a plan. All they say is it's the moral case to help the Ukrainians. Well, that could be. We can argue over that or have a conversation about that. But that doesn't mean you send money. You send money when you have a plan to win, not when you have a plan to just virtue signal, because lives are at stake. And uh, so I think on all these foreign policy questions, the weakness is going to make people uh, in the senior category say, look, I, I got I, I, we got to have a president in there who our enemies fear. I, I think that's spot on. And I knew that you would have an answer for that. Uh, you brought up Ukraine. So I wanted to bring up this recent poll that shows that an overwhelming majority of swing state voters do not approve of more funding for Ukraine. It seems like that is a growing sentiment that's going to factor into the election. What say you? Uh, yeah. And it's funny because. Uh, some people in leadership are putting out polls that say a majority of Republicans support aid in Ukraine. I actually think there are conservatives, good conservatives, who have disagreements on this. Some say they really fear that uh, Putin and Russia will you know, take over Ukraine and keep going. The people who come to CPAC who come from this part of the world tell me they actually don't fear Putin doing that, that this is more a, a question of settling old scores with parts of the Ukraine that he thinks should be part of Russia. I'm not the historian. I might not have the answer to that. But I'll tell you this, I personally am very dubious about this idea that hardworking taxpayers need to send their treasure over to the Ukraine under Joe Biden's no plan, no plan. I've never heard one, what's the plan? If you do send 17 billion, what do you get? If you send 70 billion, what do you get? What is there? All you read in the newspaper is, is that they lack ammunition. The question is, oh, well, you could get them more ammunition and the conflict could continue, but towards what end? What is the end goal? Joe Biden can't explain that. The Republicans in Congress who are pushing for this can't explain that. The neocons can't explain this. They all couch it in morality. And that's very dangerous when it comes to our national security. Morality is important, but it has to be combined with a realistic understanding of how you actually will win. And if you can ascertain that you're not going to win, then sending all that money is a fool's errand. And I think that's where we are on this policy. Absolutely. And I want to ask you about, I mean, you know, we work in politics. We are used to people saying one thing publicly and saying something else in private. But this one's pretty bad. Kamala Harris reportedly told Zelensky not to attack uh, Russian oil refineries because of the price of gas in America. Is this all about the election to them? Do they have any well, any moral stronghold that they are willing to stake in the ground and stand behind? We well, you know she didn't say don't hit, you know, humanitarian centers or, right. you know, don't bomb schools. Like if it was something like that, I think all of us would think that that's the right direction. But instead, it shows you that the Biden administration policy is to fight with one or two hands tied behind your back. 
Now, shouldn't Zelensky do anything with hardened targets that helps the Russians feel pain to end the conflict? And you literally have uh, our vice president saying, well, don't you fight, but don't fight too hard, fight kind of. And I think that's the perception in America, which is we don't have a real battle plan. And of course, Zelensky probably has to do whatever Kamala Harris tells him because uh, we're the number one driver uh, in funds to the effort or have been. Not Europe, by the way, Europe should really, this is really a European question. Europe, Europe should take the lead on this. But you know, the people I talk to in Europe are very dubious that extending the war actually helps. What most of those people wanna do is get to the peace talks table. Why are we talking about peace in Israel where Israel could literally wipe out Hamas, which would be great for humanity, uh, but we're not talking about driving uh, Russia and Zelensky to the peace table. Instead, we want right. to, you know, we want to accelerate the war. It's a strange dichotomy that's going on at the same time. And I think most people in America sense that this doesn't make sense. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right with all of that. And yes, of course, they have to listen to Kamala Harris and Joe Biden because the United States is their war sugar daddy at this point, yeah. and it can't endure without their approval. Matt, uh, I know that you and your team are already planning the next CPAC, and so we appreciate the time that you always give our audience. Thank you so much for being here. And Thank when John you, returns, Amanda. We're going to be sure to do it again. Thank you, Matt. We'll see you soon. All right. Bye-bye. All right, everybody. We are going to have to take another brief commercial break, but on the other side of that, I'm going to be talking about how three things the left has pushed through our society. They've only hindered our American performance at home and abroad, and those are DEI, cancel culture, of course, and failure to act. Nicholas Giordano, he is a professor of political science and he's up next. Welcome back everybody. The Corporation for Public Broadcasting is NPR and PBS's parent company and they received $525 million in taxpayer money to operate in fiscal year 2024. Well, the nonprofit public radio organization recently hired controversial leftist and tech executive Catherine Marr as their new CEO. Meanwhile, we've recently learned late last week, NPR suspended senior editor Yuri Berliner without pay after he openly criticized the network for having left-leaning bias. And just hours ago, Yuri resigned his position after 25 years, saying that he cannot work in a newsroom where I am disparaged by a new CEO whose divisive views confirm the very problems at NPR I cite in my free press essay. Whoa, smoke. And while cancel culture is a cancer to our society, so is DEI and the left's constant failure to act. Our next guest tonight is the host of the PAS Report podcast, and he's our good friend, Nicholas Giordano, and he joins us now. Nicholas, great to see you. Thank you for having me, Amanda. All right. So Yuri Berliner, his words came out and resonated across the press, saying that there wasn't a single Republican in the entire newsroom. And even though he he's a Democrat himself, as far as I know, but he expressed concern over the fact that this is this is a growing problem in media. And now he's out. So it seems to me that as far as that organization, NPR, PBS, there's nobody left who, who has any opposing opinion. How is that healthy for journalism? Well, I'll say this. First of all, I'm glad that Yuri resigned. It shows that some journalists out there still have integrity. And this whole story is amazing because you have National Public Radio, which we fund as taxpayers, promoting an anti-American ideology. And they show zero tolerance for any type of dissent. But the message they send, if you speak out against us internally, you will be punished. And that's why they tried suspending him. It really is dictatorial when you look at it. But it's a broader problem within our society. I mean, many of these journalists go through the biased institutions, our university campuses. We've reported at our campus reform numerous times where they're indoctrinated with this anti-American belief. And then that becomes the groupthink mindset that a Flicks, many of these journalists at places like NPR. So we, we do have a big problem in the United States, and they do it under the guise of diversity, equity, inclusion, which is nothing more than a political agenda. It's not academic. It, it has nothing to do with intellectual curiosity. It has everything to do with the groupthink mentality and also to send a message that we either fall in line and, and if you speak out against us, our organization or the government narrative, you will be punished. Yeah, it, it's been incredible to see. And uh, frankly, it's not just journalism. It's in our judicial system as well. I want you to watch this clip and then I want to get your reaction on the other side. 
Can you share your opinion of, of the former president and, and, and why you felt <laughs> that you could be unbiased? Uh, I'm not a fan. Um, I, during uh, COVID-19, I lived with someone who was immunocompromised and I think his handling of COVID-19 was uh, abysmal. <laughs> She literally starts things off with, I'm not a fan, and yet she asserts the notion, the ridiculous notion, I would add, that she can be objective and unbiased. Uh, do you think that Trump can get a fair trial in New York, Nicholas? No. As a political scientist, I actually find this trial fascinating because I don't care where you go in this country. He's the former president of the United States. He has 100 percent name recognition. And every single American has made up their mind about how they feel about the former president. They either love him or they hate him. Like there's no middle ground. It's not like people are like, well, I need to see more of him to make my determination. And so how are you going to be able to find an untainted jury? And how does he get a free and fair trial, especially when you look at the demographics of Manhattan, where about 86 percent of registered voters are Democrats? And not only are they Democrats, they're actually actually far to the left of the political spectrum. So we, we do see this idea of a weaponized judiciary. District Attorney Alvin Bragg took uh, charges that, if anything, would count as misdemeanors, turned them into felonies so he could extend the statute of limita uh, limitations. But it's even more troubling that you had the Federal Elections Commission look at this. You had the Southern District of New York uh, look at this case, and they said there was nothing there. The previous district attorney of New York, Cyrus Vance, stated that it's not worth trying a criminal prosecution on this. And yet a district attorney that campaigned on taking down a former president is pushing this forward. I think that this does extraordinarily extraordinary damage to our institution. It shows how the judiciary is being weaponized, and it shows why the American people have lost so much trust and faith in their institutions. Okay, and I want to ask you because, I mean, according to that statistic that you just cited, and we know this is true, that in New York you can find maybe one in ten who is not a crazy leftist progressive liberal. You really only need one in twelve on this jury who will stand up and say no, and then it's a hung jury, mistrial, whatever. Um, my concern, though, is that you can't even find one in twelve to actually be public about that because even if they're in their heart of hearts, they are somewhat sympathetic to President Trump. They don't want to say that publicly, and they certainly don't want that to go on record in a trial. Yeah, I mean, imagine how, how the jurors and the names being out there, wh what it's going to do yeah. and the pressure that they're going to be facing in this type of case, especially living in New York City, the belly of the beast. It's not as bad as D.C., but it's pretty close. So it, it really is concerning about the every aspect that is trial. And let's face it. When this trial goes to appeal, almost every legal scholar says that this case will be thrown out. But that's not the point. The point is to tie him up, the former president up in trial so he can't be on the campaign trail. It's to humiliate, embarrass and make sure that he has to spend money on lawyers as opposed to becoming pre the next president of the United States. And I think that will be successful. Right. I mean, we're going to see this trial go on for weeks. And no matter if the jury convicts or finds him not guilty or it's a hung jury, the, the Democrats are going to use this in their fundraising platform, as we're witnessing with the judge in this case and his daughter that has used this trial specifically to raise money for Democrat candidates. Yeah. And now of the days that they could choose to not be in session, Wednesday or Friday, they chose Wednesday, which, mean that I, which means that ICE is out Orthodox Jews, which is one of the few demographics in New York who actually support Trump overwhelmingly. Um, I want to ask you about something else, though, because on a recent podcast, you talked about the global consequences of this administration's failed leadership. And I know a lot of people are out there very concerned that we are on the precipice of World War III. The good news is we're 2-0 and o in world wars, so there's that. But what are your concerns? Well, it's concerning. This administration set the tone early on when you had uh, Secretary of State Tony Blinken, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, meeting with their Chinese counterparts and let the Chinese counterparts uh, lambast the United States about our human rights record rather than saying, hold up, let's not talk about human rights. You're one of the biggest human rights abusers. They just sat there and took it. And so it was a sign of weakness. And then 
nine months later or six months later, you had Afghanistan withdrawal in September of 2021. That will go down as one of the biggest debacles in American history. It'll be the worst foreign policy disaster. I think we have to look at the international landscape as a post-Afghanistan world. That's when Russia became much more aggressive, ultimately invading Ukraine. China became aggressive in the Pacific towards its neighbors and, and Taiwan. You have Iran becoming much more aggressive in the Middle East. And the Biden doctrine is don't. But he has no respect from the international community. Foreign leaders don't respect or fear him. And they keep on pushing the boundaries because they're allowed to get away with it. Remember, in December of 2021, Biden said that a small incursion, well, we'd have to talk about that if Russia invades Ukraine. And this is where we are today. It, the reason that this is all happening is because of failed leadership, not projecting American yep. strength. Yep. Utter, utter weakness. And uh, I just hope that we can minimize the damage coming up the next the next seven months. Nicholas, we always appreciate your time. Everybody go check out his podcast, The PAS Report. It is fantastic. All right. On that note, we're going to take another brief commercial break, but we'll be back on the other side of these months. I bet you don't know this, but stress may be why you can't lose weight. If you have moderate to high stress, a doctor formulated weight loss, weight loss supplement called Lean could be your solution. Chronic stress wreaks havoc on blood sugar, which can cause your body to store excess fat. Stress can also slow your metabolism, which fuels your weight gain as well. And you know all about stress eating and sugar cravings, right? Now the good news. The studied agreements in Lean have been shown to help maintain healthy blood sugar levels, help optimize metabolism, and keep your appetite under control. If your life is a bit stressful and you want to lose weight and add lean to your healthy diet and exercise lifestyle, get 15% off and free shipping at takelean.com. Just enter the promo code JUSTNEWS15. That's the promo code JUSTNEWS15 at takelean.com. One more time, takelean.com, promo code JUSTNEWS15. Welcome back, America. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell Hinted yesterday at the possibility of cutting interest rates, acknowledging a, quote, lack of further progress, unquote, toward the central bank's target inflation rate of 2%. Huh. Powell added that recent economic data has clearly not given us greater confidence and instead indicate that it's likely to take longer than expected to achieve that confidence. Yes, joining me now to talk more about this and much more is William Luther. He is Associate Professor of Economics at Florida Atlantic University. Professor, thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, my pleasure. I want to dig in so, on this. I don't know if this is necessarily an about face, but it at least seems like a pause and a little bit of introspection. Is this healthy for our economy? Well, what we got going on here is a, a big change in the data. So if you go back to the second mm -hmm. half of last year, we see that inflation had come down to around 2%. Um, and in the first three months of this year, uh, we're averaging around four and a half percent. So uh, very far off of, of the Fed's target. And part of that just involves, uh, uh, just relates to the way we collect the data. Um, the housing component of our inflation data tends to uh, come with a big lag, which means we're overestimating inflation a bit today and we were underestimating inflation a bit early in that inflation surge. Um, but also there, there are some other big issues in the economy at the moment, big uh, deficits coming from the federal government, um, which, which risks keeping inflation high. So um, a bit of an about face, uh, but an about face that's uh, unfortunately warranted due to the data. Yeah, and you know, you, you look at all of the facets of our economy, and I think the American people are feeling it pretty much across the board, whether it's groceries, whether it is housing, like you said, whether it's purchasing new cars or used cars. Where do you think the Biden administration can do something that would spike the economy, improve the economy in the fastest way that, you know, I think for them, they want to happen before the election? Well, um, you know, unfortunately for the Biden administration, I, I don't think there are any quick fixes here. And uh, the, the policies that they have uh, are, that they're forecasting are, are taking us in the wrong direction. So, you know, last year we ran a one point seven trillion dollar deficit. Um, and those deficits are projected to grow into the future under the Biden administration's uh, plans. Um, and and unfortunately, that puts upward pressure on 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 prices. But more importantly, it redirects resources from our very productive private sector 
to our not so productive public sector, which means economic growth will will tend to slow as those deficits rise as well. So, you know, if the Biden administration were to come out and say, hey, we're going to cut these deficits, we're going to redirect resources to the private sector, I think that would be great. Um, uh, I don't know that it would have a, a big effect prior to the election, but all of that, of course, is irrelevant because it's uh, contrary to what the Biden administration uh, actually wants to do. Yeah, I, and I want to I want to make a little bit of a comparison here and ask you your opinion. You know, you consider our economy up against the world's second largest economy, China, and they've been experiencing some economic troubles as well. But they went back to one of their age old uh, improvement tactics, building plants, manufacturing, exporting tons of goods. Is that something that Joe Biden, you know, I think that if he could have looked back at the beginning of his administration, is that something you think that he might wish that he had considered? Well, I think it's important to keep in mind that uh, the growth that we see in China is uh, not obviously great for uh, Chinese citizens. They do have a lot of uh, state-sponsored production and state-sponsored enterprises, and that will boost measured GDP, but it doesn't always translate to improvements in the standard of living, which is what we uh, ultimately want. Um, so instead of following that China model, uh, what I think the Biden administration or um, the, the Trump administration, uh, should he be elected in November, should be doing is, is really channeling those resources to the private sector, encouraging private sector investment. Um, that's ultimately going to be the, the source of a greater genuine production that, that benefits um, uh, Americans. Yeah. Um, William, I wanted to ask you about cumulative inflation, because as you know, I'm here in Los Angeles, it's a very blue city. And there are a lot of folks who I think <laughs> don't necessarily pay attention to the economy and they don't really understand uh, CPI versus inflation and what all of these numbers necessarily mean. And I think they think that that like gas prices, inflation can rise and it can fall. That obviously is not the case. Inflation just kind of ups the ante every time. As far as cumulative inflation, I think sometime in the fall of last year, it was around 16 and a half percent or something like that. I can't seem to find any recent numbers as far as what cumulative inflation is right now. Do you know? Yeah, I think we're around uh, 18 percent, something like that. Um, and so, you know, inflation, uh, you know, went up to around 11 percent, uh, came back down to, to 2 percent. And then now over the past three months, has been around four and a half percent. Um, but what that means is that prices continued to grow over that whole period. They just grew at a very high rate and then a low rate and then a moderate rate, but they were growing. And so that cumulative inflation over the period says, how much have prices risen over the entire period? And uh, since 2020, um, you know, prices have risen around 18%. So if your wages haven't increased by roughly 18% since January of 2020, then, then actually uh, you've, you've fallen behind in real terms, in, in inflation-adjusted terms. Yeah. William, before we let you go, we just got about a minute left, so I want to get into the crypto space and just ask you quickly, this is a, a sector that is expected to explode by 2030. Do you expect to see that as well? Well, I think it's going to depend in large part on how the Federal Reserve and the SEC um, uh, regulate uh, and provide access to these uh, to these upstart uh, uh, currencies. Mm -hmm. So we've seen recently that the Fed has has really cut off access to Federal Reserve master accounts, and uh, the SEC has has you know pushed back against uh, some of these uh, cryptocurrency initiatives. So that makes it hard to develop in this space. Yeah, I think you're right. Hard to develop and it's non-traditional. So it's something that a lot of people are still a little wary of. But I'm watching my Ethereum and my Bitcoin and hoping that they explode. William, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we appreciate you coming on to help us break down all of these, all of these issues. We'll see you soon. All right, and don't go anywhere. We are off to a very quick commercial break. But when we return, I'm going to be speaking with the executive director of the center. Welcome back, everybody. An important vote began today that you might not have heard about, but it could represent a watershed moment in the modern labor movement. Tennessee Volkswagen workers will be deciding whether to join the United Auto Workers Union, which would potentially make their factory one of the few automobile plants in the South to unionize. Now, we won't know the final vote until Friday, but right now we are excited to talk more about this with Mike Saltzman. He serves as the executive director of the Center for Union Facts. Mike, thanks so much for joining me. Hey, pleasure to be here. Thanks. 
Uh, explain to our audience why this is such an important and pivotal vote. Well, the United Auto Workers Union uh, has tried two previous times in Chattanooga to organize the Volkswagen plant uh, in 2014 and 2019. Uh, they've lost both times, uh, you know, based on kind of a toxic brand and reputational concerns that workers there have had about the United Auto Workers Union. The union's got a new president now, Sean Fain, who uh, amid declining membership has sort of made a, a commitment to grow the union's ranks. So this is really his first big test. Uh, and it's a big test, too, just because historically workers in the South have been reticent about getting involved with a Detroit based union uh, and sending their money to a union who might not share their values. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think that that's a well-founded concern for them and reticence. Um, I wanted to ask you, though, you said it's failed twice before. Is third time a charm? What do you think? What do you expect the news to be on Friday when they announce the result? Well, you know, uh, it's up to the workers. I still think there's uh, a lot of skepticism in Chattanooga over the union, over some of the union's political allegiances, over some of the way the union spends money. So I'm still anticipating a close vote. Uh, I think that the union this time is really banking on the celebrity of its new president. I mean, you know, Sean Fain is bigger than Taylor Swift right now. I mean, the guy's at the State of the Union. He's on the cover of Bloomberg. And so I think he's kind of got a bit of an inflated ego, and he's hoping that uh, some of his charisma and personality can sort of overcome other reservations that workers have had about the union in the past. So it's a mu as much a referendum on Sean Fain's celebrity in the UAW um, as it is on the specifics uh, on the ground in Chattanooga. Yeah. How, how many workers are we talking about? Is this a pretty sizable plant there in Chattanooga? Yeah, it's uh, I, I mean, I think we're talking about several thousand workers there. I mean, it's one of the largest employers, uh, certainly in Chattanooga, one of the larger employers in Tennessee. Uh, and, you know, it's important, too, for workers there uh, who I'm sure are being told uh, as we speak about this, that they need to show up and vote in this election, because uh, if they don't vote, uh, if they don't stop to vote, their vote doesn't count. And then ultimately, a small minority of workers who may not represent the majority viewpoint of the plant um, could still could sort of uh, decide the outcome for for the what happens next, not just that's for this generation of workers, but for many future generations, because the, the fact about UAW membership today, especially at some of the big three automakers, is that you have people working in jobs where not just maybe their father, but their grandfather may have voted to bring the union in. And they've never had the opportunity to vote on whether they still want representation. So it's really a big decision for Volkswagen workers because many generations could be living with it. And I want to ask you about other auto plants across the South. I mean, obviously, the, the conversation of unionizing has spread across all 50 states. But in Alabama, and it's not just the auto sector. I mean, you've got Amazon facilities in Alabama considering unionizing as well. But in Alabama, you've got, I know, at least a Mercedes and a Hyundai facility. Um, if this happens, if this vote goes through in Chattanooga, do you think that that's going to spread to other auto plants across the South? Well, you know, the UAW is already active in those plants. Um, they're certainly hoping uh, that it leads to momentum. But I think what you've seen in the past is that workers, especially um, you know, manufacturing workers, um, really can be thoughtful about these decisions. Uh, I don't think they're always going to rush into it sort of based on what they read in the New York Times, what they're reading in the Washington Post. Uh, I think they're going to make these decisions on what does it mean for their pocketbooks? Um, and do they agree with the values of an organization that they're now going to be sending a significant amount of their paychecks to each month? So uh, I anticipate uh, thoughtful discussions, probably sometimes hard discussions in these other markets. I also think what could be different in these other markets, too, is if the companies themselves decide to take a more vocal stance on what they think about unionization. I mean, what's what's unique in Chattanooga right now is that Volkswagen uh, has taken sort of a neutral position on, on UAW representation this time. So workers really have not heard from the company on this issue. They've really only heard opposition from their fellow coworkers. Um, in these other plants, if that's not the case, if the company decides to express its perspective uh, on unionization, uh, that could also uh, have an influence on how workers uh, think about this. Yeah, it's it's interesting to see, especially when you have Sean Fain endorsing Joe Biden, but then a week later out there admitting that many, many of the workers in his union might not feel the same way that he does, because it has been been a tough time for auto workers and union members in general. But Mike, thank you so much for coming on the show tonight to give us all of the facts 
on this important vote. So we're going to be keeping an eye on the results here over the next 48 hours. And we'll have you back on to discuss that after we know the results. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks again. All right, everybody, it's hard to believe, but it's time to wrap things up for us tonight. So rest assured, I'll be back here tomorrow night with another all-star lineup of guests. But until then, I hope that you have a wonderful night. Grant